Hello, welcome. Um, please shut down your mobiles at first. Would be very nice. And the decks. <laughs> okay. Um, FX will now tell you something about Cisco router sec security, and um, I wish you a lot of fun. Ist schon an. Cool. So, um, kann jemand die Musik ausmachen? Das ist irritierend. <laughs> um, anyway. Um, Cisco IOS Talk, the um, annual, um, how should I say that, um, Felix Fetish um, report on IOS. It seems to be pretty much the only one finding this interesting. Anyway, um, what we have today, um, can we really turn off the music behind me? Thank you. <laughs> Feels like being in an elevator or something. Um, <laughs> second level, ladies' cloth. Okay. Um, so. Uh, we're talking about um, motivations of people that hack iOS because, like, you, you probably don't believe me, but, believe, but I tell you there are more people that hack iOS than just me. Um, we're talking about the types of attacks, um, a little bit iOS architecture, uh, detection challenges, um, methods, how to overcome those challenges, and a little bit on shellcode. So you see there are slots on the agenda. Um, so bear with me if it is a little bit quick. We also have, because it is a attack and defense talk, um, a black hat meter So if you're a CISSP like I am, then tell your neighbor to wake you up for every slide that is in the upper area. And then um, everyone else can uh, watch the slides on the lower area. Um, so... <laughs> So, um, why is this talk a Cisco-centric talk? Well, the networks still consist mostly of um, those boxes. There is lots of money bound on the, on the pure metal, so you don't just change your network gear every two or three years. So, if people actually have a Cisco network, then they're going to stay with Cisco um, for a very long time. And um, this talk is also access layer equipment-centric, which is uh, Cisco speak for cheap. Um, so we're talking about those small boxes here um, and not the big boxes um, simply because we um, don't actually have big boxes. Um, we're actually now we do, but we only have them for a week or so. Um, in terms of other equipment, um, Juniper being the second biggest player in this market um, from a attack and forensics point of view, they're actually just boring um, because they're a not so free anymore free BSD. Um, and so all the things that we know about FreeBSD, both from the attack and the defense, apply. Um, the same holds true for your uh, MediaMark plastic router, um, just that it has a Linux instead of a BSD. So this is why I find Cisco interesting. Um, really quick two minute, um, because people still ask me, why would you actually hack routers? And I'm like, because I love it. And then they ask, why would anyone else do it? Um, so, the thing is with today's host security, um, if you take this machine, um, you don't actually gain much, except for maybe if you're a firewall or something, um, but you actually don't gain much in terms of um, how you can attack the network from this point. Um, and you can't do anything else to the other machines. If you take the switch, um, then all the stuff that used to work on hub networks um, actually works again, so you can um, break the separation, you can modify any traffic, and it's actually really hard for the end user to um, yeah, find out if the network is compromised or not. In fact, it's almost impossible. So there is no reverse NUC, there is no way for me to connect to a network and know that the infrastructure is not um, taken over already. And of course, if you take the router, and then um, you also be the network um, to the big bad internet, um, which can be useful. Um, so on a bigger scale, um, this is um, how internet works look like. So you have multiple routing domains, and they do have a bunch of security. They have like firewalls, IDS, IPS, or whatever your silver bullet of the day is um, at the borders. Then they have um, ingress and egress filtering, which is the just routing speech for 
um, there is stuff filtered, and um, they usually they should have anti-spoofing, um, but it's still not um, globally deployed on the internet scale, uh, which is sad. And then uh, we have full trust in the core, um, because that's how the thing designed is. So you actually have to um, talk to each other and trust, your, and trust each other on the routing information to actually get data from A to B. So you can't really um, prevent anyone else fucking with you. So network security, therefore, is a hierarchical thing. So the higher up you in the hierarchy attack, the more you control, and the harder it is to find you. Like downstream um, defending is really common. Like if the ISPs wouldn't defend against people like you on the DSL lines, um, they would be out of business. Um, but they can hardly defend against like the tier one they're linking up to, because if the tier one tells them the internet is gone, um, that's exactly his point. Like it is gone. <laughs> so. Um, so in this example, if we have our lovely um, international symbol for an asshole, um, <laughs> and, and he takes this one router in the enhanced IGRP domain, he just controls the local network. If he's taking the border router, he controls all the networks, because if he controls the core, um, he can tell anyone where everyone else is, which I think is control. So some people still come up to me and say, well, yeah, that's no longer valid because we have HTTPS and SSL and SSH and all that, and everything is encrypted. Well, that is true. However, encryption and especially integrity checking only allows you to detect if someone else fucked with your message. Now, if you detect that, what are you going to do? That's really bad because if it's in a corporate network, for example, you have absolutely no way to get around this because if the user could change the path through the network, like in this example, he will uh, want to not jump over the red Cisco, um, that would be called source routing. And there is a very good reason this is turned off in the internet altogether because then you can actually do a lot more harm than good. What is Mr. Kaminsky doing down there? <laughs> so, all this is pretty much by design. This is how IP network um, are designed. So, what's the attacker motivation besides the cool points I just made? Um, well, Windows and Unix become really um, harder targets, and um, iOS actually doesn't. <laughs> so, <laughs> because it stays around for a very long time and is not updated. And if it's updated, then it's updated with a new version that comes with new features. Um, for example, a regular enterprise image um, comes with, in, in default, comes with a full voice XML IVM um, that is driven by Tickle scripts, <laughs> um, which I've never seen anyone use, but it's in there and it's code that you can execute and that someone else could have fucked up. Um, and backdoored iOS images become popular simply because people realized um, that it's a really, really cheap way um, of getting access to routers is to publish backdoored iOS images um, and then wait for all the people that try to get a Cisco certification to download them and run them in Dynamips. And when they are done, um, they try to port this configuration at work and then they realize that only works with the same image and then they copy the image that they use in Dynamips over to a real router, and out of the sudden you get access to something. So we actually need ways to handle those intrusions. Now, the type of attacker we're looking at here is not actually your arbitrary script kitty. Um, development of reliable iOS exploits is quite costly if you have people that know how to do it. Um, and yeah, they wouldn't just waste a zero-day exploit on um, an infrastructure if they're not really, really sure um, that it's going to work. And the, the idea behind this is actually to gain a foothold in an infrastructure and not to take over the router, do some shit with it, and then be, and be done with it. Um, so they want to stay un, um, undetected, and that 
prevented in the past people from actually developing um, too many of those exports because it was a lot cheaper to actually take over the Windows or the Unix machines. Now, the modern rootkits that are used in banking trojans, for example, are um, fairly expensive in development because they need to be fairly good. So it actually becomes cost efficient for a number of uh, three-letter or Unicode character organizations um, to develop Cisco exploits because they're now actually cheaper um, than a short living Windows exploit. So types of attacks that we have, protocol based, um, that's the well known stuff. Um, you participate in the network, you talk to protocol that the routers talk and if they're stupid they listen and then um, you're root. Um, that includes things like um, DNS attacks or um, exter um, exterior routing um, a text like shown uh, from, from Alexander at DEF CON, um, where they took over like large parts of the DEF CON network. Um, so this is the well-known stuff. The well-exploited stuff is actually functionality attacks. Um, people use still weak passwords on Cisco's. Um, my theory is you study about two years for the lab session um, of your CCIE certification. And in those two years, you have billions of configurations to cover. However, every time you set up a router, um, you type the password Cisco. And if you're conditioned two years to type the same password ever and ever and ever again, it's highly unlikely that you're going to change that in the future. Um, so this is actually a big problem. Um, then the same holds true for SNMP communities, of course. Um, and people still post entire configurations on the internet and say, look, this doesn't work. And then, well, you go and you decode the password because that is trivial. Um, and then you go, hmm, okay, I know why it doesn't work and I can fix it for you right away. So, <laughs> that, that actually still happens. And then there's vulnerabilities and two of them are really, really big. Um, the HTTP level vulnerability is fairly old and um, you can, but if you look at proxy servers or other um, logging gateways on the internet, people are still scanning for this. Now, a arbitrary rule about blackheads is they're not scanning for stuff that they're not expecting to find. So, um, by the fact that you're seeing a lot of people scanning for this, you can um, at least estimate that they find a lot of machines where they can actually get level 16 access um, by HTTP. However, it's very, very rare that people actually turn on um, the web server on their routers if they have a little bit of clue about this. So, the other one is a really, really um, big vulnerability from 2008. So, SNMP is used for managing networks. So, you have to have SNMP in all the networks. Now, um, SNMP was always lame with the um, communities because it's a simple password string that sends a clear text over the network and sooner or later people discovered that is a bad idea. Now, um, when they developed SNMP version 3, the main emphasis was on having a secure, cryptographically sound authentication. Um, but there are also what I call byte caspers. Um, they try to save like two bytes in the network protocol message and then they need like 500 kilobytes of codes to pause it. Um, and this is pretty much what happened here. So um, they said, well, we are sending a hash or an HMAC actually over um, our community string. Now, um, the thing is this, if you take like half of an HMAC, cryptographically it should be pretty much the same statement. Um, if you don't know why, then ask Rudiger Weiss for it. Um, however, this is how they specified it. So they said, well, you can say a portion of the HMAC, and then um, this portion must match um, your calculated HMAC. Yeah, and the portion has a length field, and most people implemented it um, by the um, net SNMP code, um, which many people copied <laughs> and um, they implemented it like this so they take the length field from the packet and the HMAC from the packet and compare it to theirs. Now if someone says my HMAC is one byte, he needs approximately 256 packets to get access to the router. Full access, mind you. Now the most amusing thing about this